The deadline to declare for the NBA draft has come and gone, which means we're now waiting for the next deadline, when underclassmen have to pull their name out of the NBA draft if they're testing the waters. That day is May 30th. It is a five weeks away, after the NBA draft combine and nearly a month before the draft itself. So there is a long way to go with this process. But as things stand today, here is a list of all the players that have signed with an agent and that are testing the waters. There are more than 150 players on that list. So to help you pass it all down, here are the most influential should I stay or should I go decisions that are going to be made over the course of the next five weeks. Omari Spellman and Dante D.I.V.I.N.C.E.N.Z.O. Villanova Villanova already lost a pair of juniors to the NBA draft as both Michael Bridges, a potential top 10 pick, and Jalen Brunson, last year's reigning National Player of the Year, declared for the draft and signed with an agent. Eric Paschal and Phil Booth both opted to return to school for their redshirt seniors where, along with returnees Jermaine Samuels, Colin Gillespie and Demir Cosby Rountree in a recruiting class that is as good as any that Jay Wright had landed in his time on the main line, has Villanova's program in a great place for the future. And frankly, even with just that group of guys, the Wildcats are likely still going to enter the as the favorite to win the Big East once again, although that might say more about the Big East than it does about Villanova. But if they get Dante DiVincenzo and Omari Spellman back, we could be looking at a situation where this is once again the best team in college basketball. Elsa, Getty Images Let's start with DiVincenzo, since I think HES the more likely of the two to return. On the one hand, he might end up being a pre-season first-team All-American if he makes the choice to play for Jay Wright for another, and as such, he'll likely end up taking over the lion's share of Villanova's offense as a result. But more importantly, at least when it comes to the draft, is that DiVincenzo still has some things that he can improve on that would make him a more palatable first-round pick. As dynamic as he was this, DiVincenzo has always been a streaky scorer, a mixed bag as a decision-maker and a questionable ball handler. Those are things that can be improved upon and, with a weaker draft coming up in 2019, the kind of thing that might be able to sneak him into the lottery. Spellman is a different story. H.E. is something of a finished product in terms of an NBA prospect. There are things that he can improve on, his post-game, for one, and his ability to drive left, another, but the weight loss that he went through in his twos as a part of the Villanova program is what turned him into an NBA player. Given his size, his ability to shoot from three, the way he attacks close-outs and the fact that he can protect the rim and rebound the ball now that helps shed 50 pounds, there is likely a spot for him in an NBA rotation somewhere. And while DiVincenzo can improve where HES picked by coming back, I think Spellman is always going to find himself in the range of being a late first rounder or an early second rounder. The catch, however, is that I think Spellman's return might be more important to Villanova as a team. His skill set is what brings everything together and makes that Villanova offense so difficult to guard. As it stands, Villanova is currently the number two overall team in the NBC Sports preseason, top 25. With both players officially back, they'll have to think long and hard about whether or not they should be number one. Frederick Breeden, Getty Images Caleb Martin, Cody Martin and Jordan Caroline, Nevada should Nevada get to all three of these guys back for another, the Wolf Pack are going to enter the 2018-19 as a preseason top 10 team. But are they going to get all three of these guys back that, at this point, is a major question mark for one, simple reason, they are all staring down the barrel of a redshirt senior, meaning that it will be the fifth year that the three, all of whom transferred into Nevada, will be in college. If they already have their degree, and they are all turning 23 years old in the next year, is a shot at making the final four enough incentive to return to school for Caroline it might be. As talented as he is, we're not sure that he gets drafted if he turns pro. Both Martin twins have an actual chance to end up hearing their name called on draft night. Caleb is one of the best shot makers in college basketball and Cody is a 3 and D role player, but it would be as second round picks. If all three are gone, then I think we're talking about Nevada as a team that is going to have to battle just to make the NCAA tournament. Mike Herman, Getty Images, Kevin H. U. E. R. T. E. R. and Bruno Fernando, Maryland. There are so many teams in the Big Ten with so much on the line over the course of the next five weeks, but I'm not sure anyone has more at stake than Maryland, who is still waiting to hear what Werther and Fernando are going to do. Let's pretend, for a second, that both return to school. 
Werther, a 6-foot-7 wing that averaged 14.6 points and shot 42% from three, joins Anthony Cowan and Daryl Mossell to give the Terps one of the better backcourts in college basketball while Fernando, a native of Angola, would be in line for a breakout sophomore campaign. Throw in a recruiting class that includes transfer Schneider Herard and five-star Jalen Smith up front and promising four-star wings like Eric Ayala, Cyril Smith and Aaron Wiggins, and there is something here for Mark Turgeon to work with. It's why Maryland is a top-20 team in our preseason rankings. But Werther has some second-round appeal this given his size, length and shooting ability while Fernando, who had some impressive moments as a freshman, is tangentially linked to the FBI investigation into college basketball corruption. Fernando and Kansas freshman Silvio D'Souza as childhood friends that both have the same American Guardian. That Guardian allegedly received a payout of at least $20,000 to get D'Souza out from under payments he already received from a rival apparel company when he committed to Kansas D'Souza, who played for Under Armour-sponsored high school and AAU teams, was considered a near lock to head to Maryland, who is Under Armour's flagship program. Without those two, Anthony Cowan will take on the role of Mellow Trimble, trying to carry the load for the Terps, and I'm not sure. HES cut out for it the way that Trimble was. Gregory Seamus, Getty Images C.A.R.S.E.N. Edwards, Purdue Edwards might end up being the best lead guard in college basketball next. I would not be surprised to see him end up as a consensus preseason first-team All-American should he end up coming back to school, and if he does, I think Purdue is a borderline top 25 team that will be back in the NCAA tournament. Without him, however, and the Boilermakers will have to replace five starters on a team that really didn't have much in the way of quality depth. Edwards is the difference between Purdue being a good team and Purdue being in a total rebuild. Ethan Happ, Wisconsin Wisconsin just finished the worst the program has had in two decades, snapping a 19-year NCAA tournament streak and a 16-year run of top four finishes in the Big Ten. And yet, I feel good about where this team is headed. Much of that, as I noted in this column, has to do with a promising crop of youngsters and the way that they finished last despite being injured and, you know, young. But much more of it had to do with the idea that Hap, an All-American in 2016-17 and a preseason All-American heading into last, would be back for his senior year. He is the anchor for this group on both ends of the floor. James Palmer Jr. and Isaac Copeland, Nebraska Palmer was one of the best players in the Big Ten last, quietly putting together an incredible year that not enough people paid attention to. Copeland had his best as a collegian last year, and the two of them, the two leading scorers for a team that tied for fourth in the Big Ten last year, are the reason why Nebraska look like they have a shot to be even better next year. They are a borderline top 25 team that should get Tim Miles back to the NCAA tournament. They are also both transfers that might opt to turn professional with a degree in hand, and if that were to happen, the Cornhuskers are going to be heading back into rebuilding mode. Jamie Squire, Getty Images Charles Matthews, Michigan Michigan is the team that I've gotten the most pushback on for leaving out of the NBC Sports preseason, top 25. I have them out right now because I'm not convinced that Matthews returns to school and, when combined with losing their two best offensive weapons, Mo Wagner and Muhammad Ali Abdurrahman, to graduation, would leave Michigan very young and without the kind of offensive firepower that they had this year. Matthews coming back would change that outlook and make the Wolverines more of a finished product than they are without him. Matthews, individually, would be a potential All-American and top 20 picks, if he were to return and show off an ability to shoot more consistently from three. Bryce Brown, Jared Harper, and Austin Wiley. Auburn I'm honestly not sure what to do with Auburn here. They are already losing Mustafa Heron to the draft, and it is hard for me to justify to myself ranking the Tigers in the top 15 of the NBC Sports preseason top 25. They'll all be there so long as they get all three of these players back. If they decide to enter the draft, Auburn will look a lot more like they did in the first three years of Bruce Pearl's tenure. K-H-Y-R-I Thomas, Creighton Thomas has a chance to have a nice NBA career. He only Stands 6 foot 3, but his 6 foot 11 wingspan combined with the fact that he makes better than 40% of his threes makes him an intriguing 3 and D prospect. I do think there's a chance that he'll be a first round pick this year should he opt to declare for the draft, and that should make his return to Creighton all that much more important. The Blue Jays already lost Marcus Foster, and losing Thomas, who is the one elite defender on a roster that is built for space, pace and scoring, would be another major blow. 
with him in the fold and the return of a young core of Tyshawn Alexander, Mitchell Balak and Jacob Epperson, the Blue Jays suddenly look like the second-best team in the Big East. Adoka Azabuki, Kansas Azabuki is on this list now because of the fact that Kansas will, more likely than not, be without the services of Silvio D'Souza following the latest reveal in the FBI's investigation into college basketball corruption. If Azabuki opts to remain in the draft, that means that the five spot in the Kansas lineup will be manned by Mitch Lightfoot and freshman David McCormick. The reason that Azabuki is so low on this list is that, without him, I would why expect Kansas to play a smaller, more versatile lineup, and that might actually make them more difficult to match up with. Put another way, losing Azabuki would have a bigger impact on how Kansas plays instead of how good they actually end up being. TYUS Battle, Syracuse Battle is a borderline first-round pick, a guy that could go anywhere between the 20s and the 40s, depending on which NBA organizations fall in love with him. If HES back, Syracuse has to be thought of as a potential tournament team because, you know, they were this year without all that much around him. If HES gone, things could get ugly. MARCQUISE Reed and Shelton Mitchell, Clemson Clemson's two best players down the stretch of the Reed and Mitchell back on campus would likely make the Tigers a tournament team for a second straight. If they end up leaving school, then Brad Brownell is going to be happy that they were able to relieve the pressure on his him with a trip to the Sweet 16 this past tournament.